All right, everyone, welcome back to the Ramp Podcast. Today, I am joined with a super special guest, Mr. John Morris. John is joining us all the way from Illinois, correct? Yes, cold, rainy Illinois, but it's sunny in here. All right, that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. I used to live in Chicago myself, so it's May. It's that treacherous half yes. on, half off summer time over there. I'm in LA. It's always nice here. Oh, lucky. Yeah. So John, if you remember, we invite our guests on to the rap podcast, specifically the how I sell series to ask them the same five questions in apples to apples comparison, of uh, you, your early career, all the things that you've set up and where folks on our, on our audience can, can learn from. So if you're ready, I would love to jump in to those five questions. Let's go. All right, let's do it. So. The first question for you is what is the best investment an early career salesperson can do for their career and why? The best investment, read Spin Selling. It's, it's a really easy book to read by Neil Rackers and it kind of breaks down how you sell high ticket advisement type selling or high ticket items where you're essentially influencing the client to buy rather than selling, right? So it's more question-based and kind of the premise of it is first off, SPIN is an acronym, situation, problem, impact, need, payoff. And in order for you to really be a solution provider to your client, which in sales, by the way, you are the start of the solution. And in order to provide a solution, you have to understand the problem. So that's why situation starts. You have to fully understand who are you talking to? What is their role in this? What's their, their current uh, process? What are they doing now? Why are they doing that? It's all open-ended questions. Who, what, where, when, why? And you transition from fully understanding their situation before you start moving into, hey, what's your biggest challenge, right? We need to fully understand the situation because that determines the problem questions you'll ask. So then you can frame every problem question with, Okay, so this is your situation. What problem is that creating? How is that creating a challenge? Why is that creating a challenge, right? So you start to build out that problem. Before you transition to the next thing though, and it's in, in steps, so you gotta get situation, then you get problem, then you move to impact. So the impact would be like, how is that affecting the amount of time that you work per day? How is that keeping you from scaling your organization? How is that holding you back from getting the attention that you would like to for the organization? How is that potentially personally holding you back from moving to the next level in your career? Now we emotionalize this thing. We, we turn it into the want behind the want behind the want. Every human being you sell to is an emotional creature. We're all emotional creatures. So we buy products and services, but we typically have intent behind the product or service. There's something that we're trying to achieve. And if we're in that role, the decisions that we make dictate and determine whether or not we move to the next role. That next role is where the emotional thing is. So somebody approaches me in sales, right? They'd be very wise to understand why is this decision important to me? How does it impact my career if it's successful or not successful? Now, all of a sudden, I'm putting more, more chips on the table than, hey, look, price right? Everybody wants to focus on price, get people away from price by making it emotional. And then you transition to need payoff. So need payoff kind of goes like this. So if you didn't have this situation that was causing this problem, that was having this impact on you, what would your life look like? And you make the client explain to you what it is that they would, their situation would look like if they have the solution, which is your product. This is why car dealerships have you take a test ride because you see yourself in the car. And if you've ever noticed, they drive you past some office building that has mirror glass and they say, hey, look over there. So you can see yourself in the car. How do I look in this bad boy, right? Now you're starting to visualize yourself in that product. So situation, problem, impact, need, payoff. It changed my life at 25 years old. Everything that I was doing was presentation-based. How can I come up with the next cool thing to say to the client? It's not about the cool thing you can say to the client. It's the cool things you can get the client to say to you. And that comes from open-ended questions. Spin selling is where it's at. Sweet. I love that. If you were to look at our sales training, you would see spin selling as a bullet point, something that is required. A reading. I love that book. I did not hit it early enough in my career as well. I think I got it when I was 28 or 30, but 
excellent, excellent advice. And certainly I think what resonated with me the most outside of the book recommendation, which is great, is that people always sell to people and people are emotional. People have feelings and thoughts. And until we, as a society, either mature or whatever you want to call it, regress to robots selling to robots, it's always going to be, there's always going to be emotions within a sale and you're going to have to figure those out and find out what, what pains, what problems are worthy of solving. And if you can solve them with your product. I love that point. Technology was designed to make things efficient, faster, more accurate. It, they weren't designed to make the sale, right? That comes from the human being. And that's why you need really a perfect combination of the two. If you can make the buying experience and the service experience and the product that you provide technology-based and efficient and effective so that it's an easier utilizations. If you can make that simpler, then that's great, but you still have to humanize your approach and get to the emotion. And that changes everything, changes the game. So true. So true. Also, also gave us a, a really good tip, which I did not know about, about car sales. So be, be, be careful out there. They're going to try to put you in that <laughs> moment and <laughs> I'm going to drive you through the woods, but that could be scary. Yeah. too. <laughs> true, true. All right. That's great. Moving on to question number two, how has your view on sales changed over your career? And why do you think that's happened? I used to be a big proponent of ABC, always be closing, right? Now I'm a big proponent of ABI, always be influencing. And the reason that that changed was because for so long, when I was younger and I wanted to hit quota and hit numbers and lacked purpose, I lacked purpose. I wanted money. I wanted, I wanted prizes. I wanted to be at the top of the leaderboard. And some of that was just youth. Some of that was not going through enough stuff in life to understand what adversity means and how it changes. And the other thing was just establishing more poise as I've gotten older to understand that it's about the other people, not about you. If you do great things for people, you win three times, right? So that whole comes back to you threefold. It's true. They've been saying it for thousands of years for a reason. If you give more, you get more. So I used to be all about ABC. Could I ask a question and then give them a power close, right? And it was like slapping five, like, oh man, I just closed that guy, right? And then guess what? They didn't reorder. They didn't come back. There was no partnership. They felt like a number because they were a number. I treated them like a number. They were a transaction. What I've shifted to over time, and, and this comes from, again, a maturation process, is always be influencing. People don't want to be sold. They want to buy. So it's all about guiding them to the right decision. And it's also about being transparent and upfront. If you are not the solution, be a good person and guide them to the solution, even if it's another company um, or another uh, completely different thing. That will come back to you as well because they may not be the solution, but they'll refer five friends because of the experience they have with you. And those folks might be the right answer. So you're always having to focus on the fact that you are a representation of the brand. That's the cool thing about sales, man. You're first in, your representation of the brand. Marketing sends the message out, right? They get people's attention. You're the first one to really have engagement and dialogue. You're the first representation of the brand, which means you need to steward the brand which means you need to be transparent and you need to be a great, what's the word I'm trying to use, Dan? Shepherd. A, a shepherd. Yes, that's great. Or steward. You need to be a great steward to the brand, not just your commission check, not just trying to make the sale. You've got to do that. So that comes from really getting it across the clients of what the whole company is about, not just your product, right? So be, always be influencing is talking about the company's core values, the overall why, the fact that you're supported by a team of people, the fact that the person who mops the floors is gonna care about you as a client as much as the CEO will, and getting somebody completely entrenched into your overall organizational message, not just the solution you provide. Yeah, I love it, I love it. The ABI method rings true. I've noticed it even more, obviously, in my current role as founder, and it certainly has matured. I think it's probably a natural evolution of a salesperson is in the beginning, right? When you're young, hungry, right out of school, right? The first role, whatever it is, 
you do optimize for, for money and not that that's a, that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's like the, the old quote, play, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? That money isn't going to come back to you. It's going to be a one-time thing. And yeah, I think, I think you nailed it. It's about developing relationships and, and having the confidence and the ability to say like, okay, we're, we're not a great fit for you right now. And that's okay. Like, I don't want to sell you something you're not going to use. It's not beneficial to you. And it's just a reframing. And I think sales has kind of gone that way over the last few years, at least I've noticed the empathetic version of sales versus this like Wolf of Wall Street type. I think we're seeing a big maturation of the sales industry or sales as a category from that type of sale to consultative, constructive, challenging, and also what you, what you said, right? Influence plus making sure folks are actually in the right fit for what you have to offer. Yes. There's been a big shift too, right? Like if you see companies like Batterop and Leon, they've done a lot of work on getting folks to understand the difference between managing and coaching. And it's managing is really focusing on the KPIs, the metrics and all those different things. Whereas coaching is really understanding the human experience, understanding the journey, understanding what people are going through, making sure that you push the right buttons for the right personality type to get the maximum that that person wants to be. Not that you are telling them they have to be because of the metrics, right? It's all about coaching. And we're seeing this transition as well in business, the shift from the importance of IQ to EQ, right? If you have both, oh my gosh, you're an absolute stud, brilliant human being, wonderful person to be part of the organization. But we're seeing that it's more and more important that folks have EQ over just IQ. I think companies used to hire people just off the resume showing that they had a tremendous IQ and they had all these achievements in university and so on. And now I think folks are taking into consideration far more, how will they be a culture ad? Will they mentor? Will they bring people up? Are they a good representative of the organization? Will they champion the brand? Those things have really changed. And I think it's great for society and business. For sure. I totally agree. Obviously fully biased here at Ramped, but we, we fundamentally believe that skills are the new currency, not what your resume says and not how your LinkedIn profile looks. It's all skills based, all experience based. What can you bring to the table above and beyond what you write, have written or wrote on a piece of paper? I love that. That's why you're crushing it at Ramp. That's why you're crushing it, man. That is, that is, yeah, we're on our way. We're on our way. <laughs> Scaling fast. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sweet. Awesome. Great answer. Question number three, what's one mistake that you made early in your career that has shaped the way that you operate today? I thought being an expert meant that I was, I had the parking spot and was the coolest guy and had the office and, and wore the, the silkiest ties with the biggest knot, right? And closed the most deals and brought in the right, most cash and all that stuff. And that's not what makes you an expert. What makes you an expert is whether or not you can teach what you do and bring people with you. Right. And that's completely changed. So offering your time up to somebody that is maybe five steps down on the journey. I like to say to my people all the time, I already made all the mistakes. So you don't have to, right? I already made every mistake. I made mistakes mentally. I made mistakes physically. I made mistakes in my journey. I made mistakes with how I treated clients, treated employees and how I was self-righteous and all these different things. I already made all those mistakes so that you don't have to. So learn from what I've done so that you don't, so you scale faster than I did um, and you feel purpose and you can look yourself in the mirror. My dad always said to me, if you, if you were looking in the mirror and you're shaving or you're brushing your teeth and you can't make full eye contact back with the person that you're looking at, something needs to change. And I started to recognize that while I've on the surface had all these amazing things and felt like I was really getting a, awards and a lot of success and this and that. Couldn't look myself in the mirror. So what's more important? Now, I can't wait to brush my teeth. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I feel like my focus is far more on my family, my kids, and the people I'm surrounded by and wanting them to succeed. And I take a lot of pride in their success over my own. And that would be the, that would be the failure and that would be the journey for me. I'm not, I'm not great at it yet. I'm still climbing and I still have all kinds of warts I want to get rid of, but the effort is there and the awareness is there that that's, what's got to change. Yes. Great advice. I don't think we've heard it on any of our seasons, but I, I love, I love the way your dad put it, that 
is, is as straightforward as you could say, you gotta be able to be proud of yourself first and foremost, or else you're going to be living somebody else's or living something else's journey. So I, I think that's really eloquent. I think kids will do that to you too, right? Now you have two or three or four, however many you have three eyeball. Yeah. Two boys. So you have, you have four, four eyeballs on you at all times. And, and that's really important. They, uh, they, they will emulate every single thing you do. I have two boys myself, so they will just look at you and do exactly what you do. It's really, really an interesting thing as, as they come into the world and how that changes and how you, it's not like you have to put on a show, but it really will see you in your elements, no matter what they, they have no BS filter. So here's my proudest moment, Danny, right? My kid played in a tournament and they won the tournament. His team did, they went five and oh, my kid had a 700 on base percentage for the tournament and just absolutely wow. did great. And that wasn't, that wasn't the proudest moment. What was the proudest moment when, was when the comp, when the team was facing adversity in the championship game, he was, he was the one picking everyone up saying, Hey, don't put your chins down. We're still in this to the last fight. They made a three run comeback with two outs in the last inning to win the championship on a walk-off double. And, and that inning, the heads were hanging and he, he was in the dugout and he's the smallest kid on the team. He's 12 years old. He's the smallest kid. So he's got the smallest voice and whatever, but he was the one saying, uh, uh, we're not hanging our heads. Come on. We can come through. Right. And that my, my, my heart lit up. Cause I was like, look, you don't need a title to be a leader. You also don't need to be the biggest kid on the team to be a leader. You don't need to have the big hit home runs be the big, the throw the fastest, whatever. Sometimes being the leader means that you understand the situation and you can get people to understand what is in front of them and that they need to focus. Right. And so I was like, whoa, that, and that made me feel like a million bucks. Cause I've been working a lot on that myself the last few years that, Hey, look, it's like, you don't have to put up the biggest numbers. What you got to do is you got to make certain that you you lead from the front, but you also have the right message at the right time when people need to hear it. Yeah, it's great. That's great. What's uh, what's your son's name? Griffin. Call him Griff. Yeah. He's got about 50 nicknames. Griff. Yeah. Griff. That's great. That's great. I, I wish, wish he was around when I was playing baseball as a kid. I'm not going to share my uh, batting average, but it was not impressed. I could have used his positivity and energy to pick me up when I was down. Well, he he would have found you. I tell you, he would have found you. Yeah, that's great. Well, awesome story. And yeah, just those, those moments where you're just so proud of, of them. It's, it's really cool to watch in action. It's a good segue to our next question. Question number four, who has had the greatest impact on your career and how have they impacted you? This one's got a knot in my throat. Um, my dad, and he's, he's no longer with us four years. And I took for granted every lesson that he told me while he was alive. And now I carry every, every, I remember them all now. That would be it. I mean, he, he speaks through me. And the cool thing is I get to hear it first, right? And then I get to say it to other people and that's honoring him. And gosh, I got emotional. It's given me, it's given me a chance to, to impact people and carry out his name which is, which is pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, thank you for sharing. So sorry you passed on. That's and... pride. That's not sadness. That's pride. That's great. I can feel it. And obviously you answered the previous question mentioning something that he taught you as well. So it's, it's, it's clear that he's had a profound impact and it's really cool that you had someone in your life that somebody in your life who, who has impacted you in that way. And it sounds like he was certainly a legendary guy with a ton of, a ton of things to, to teach and a ton of things that, that you remember. And it's also great that you now get to share them with the world and, and with your kids as well. Yeah, it's, it's really a blessing. I wish I would have been listening earlier, but everything happens for a reason. And I guess all that matters is at some point you start to hear it. I think he wishes I probably would have heard it earlier too, but it makes me, it makes me feel very proud that everything that he put in was, wasn't for not right. So, Hey pops, I heard you, I'm using it. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thanks again for sharing that, John. So our last question we've asked all our guests, all three seasons of the ramp podcast is if you could go back in time, now that you have the benefit of hindsight and give yourself one piece of advice 
as you're entering into your career, what would that piece of advice be? Wow, that's a great question. Really put much more time and emphasis into fully understanding every in and out of the organization that you represent from how accounting is done, how administration is done. So roam the building, okay? If you're in sales, don't just stay siloed and talk to other salespeople. You'll get a lot of value from that, right? And you should interact and, and so on. But you got to roam the building. And if roaming the building means that you're on Teams or Zoom with other people, set up and schedule time to talk to somebody in accounting, talk to finance, talk to procurement, talk to the warehouse, talk to production, talk to everybody in the organization. First off, it shows interest stay engaged right so that's extremely important you need to show interest in the full brand and everything that happens and the one thing is a salesperson too if you ever ever have a feeling or comment or say to another staff member like hey we wouldn't be where we're at as an organization if it wasn't for sales that is probably like the worst way worst thing that you could ever say it's the most insulting thing and it's really not beneficial in any way shape or form the reality is that every cog in the machine matters. And so even if it's the person at the front desk answering the phone, don't ever take that person for granted. That person is putting every ounce of effort in and they are, the, in many cases, I said sales is the first voice, but if it's an inbound, it might be that, that person at the receptionist. In many cases, they know more about the organization than anybody else because they're interacting with everybody. So. What I would say is um, try and become an expert in all the roles that exist within the building um, that represent your overall brand. It'll make you better in sales and representing the organization and being able to answer questions for clients. And it also allows, it allows other folks in the business to be highlighted. And guess what they'll do? They'll pay you back left and right. They'll give you favors. They'll, you need marketing to do that thing for you. Promote the heck out of marketing and what they're doing. They'll, they'll do favors for you. You need that person in production to get you a spec or a sample or whatever, and it doesn't fit their production schedule. Guess what? If you, if you treat them a certain way, they'll do those things. So there's benefits just from the human experience, but there's also benefits to your role. So learn the whole role, learn the whole brand, learn all the roles, learn what people do, roam the building and share your knowledge, expertise, and kindness with everybody in the building. And guess what? You will scale faster than you can believe. That's great. Again, I think this is actually the first time we've heard it in all three seasons, but it's great advice. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, or I've actually been guilty of not learning every part of a business in my first few months there, just because I thought I have blinders on, just do your job, get the job done. And that meant like focus intensely on what's in front of you when really it'll help you become not only a better salesperson, but a better employee. And a lot of times that information, at least from our perspective at Ramp, should be readily available ahead of the interview. Like folks should be transparent about what the business looks like and who works there and why they work there and what people care and love about the business. And oftentimes it's not the case. And oftentimes you have to learn that on your own. So this is a very good roadmap. John, thanks for Thanks for sharing a roadmap on. Danny, could I add to that point? Yeah, yeah, of course. Most people, when they get into sales, they get into sales because it's the point of entry into the organization. They ultimately want to move up in the organization. If I'm Danny as a founder and I'm looking at who I'm going to put into the next role to manage people, I'm looking at somebody that understands EBITDA. I'm looking at somebody who understands shareholder value. I'm looking at somebody who understands productivity, HR. I'm looking at somebody that's going to do that. So it's not just for that reason that we just discussed, but it's also the reason of you put yourself in a position where you were the only possible choice for promotion because you understand the whole game. And if you want to get promoted, it shouldn't be. If you want to get promoted, you need to put the decision makers of your promotion in a position where you're the obvious choice. There is no other choice. In many cases, it's not based on numbers. It's based on understanding of the whole business. Can you lead the whole business and the charge? And if you can try and run parallel with Danny, who's the founder, who built it, it's his baby, right? If you can run parallel with him, 85%, because he knows all of it as the CEO. But if you can run, try and run parallel and understand as much or at least show as, as much engagement, you're going to be the obvious choice over somebody else who might have better numbers. 100%. 100%.
great framework, great way to think about it. I also think a, a, a really solid place to end too, John. Thanks for, uh, thanks for all the guidance and going a level deeper than most go on the podcast as well. Really, really appreciate that. Where can folks find you? Yeah, so I am all over LinkedIn. I apologize for that, but I have a blast with it. So you can check me out on LinkedIn. You can check out our website at www.clubcolors.com. My email is jmorris at clubcolors.com. And if you DM me on LinkedIn and you actually personally wrote the note and you don't try and offer me something, but you actually just try and get to know me, I will respond at 2 a.m. Like I'm crazy like that. I also host a podcast called In the Club, powered by Club Colors. You can see the sign, the hat, the logo, and we talk about anything and everything having to do with a brand. It could be inspiration. It could be sales, marketing, brand management, anything. So check us out on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube as well. After you watch the Ram podcast. Great. Love it. Love it. Love it. So John just gave you all an in-depth look into how to reach out to him for our audience. No auto messages on LinkedIn. Listen to his stuff. It's widely available. Make it personal and he will respond even late at night or early in the morning. John, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us and for our audience. Until next time on The Ramp Podcast. Hey.